Our oldest enemy isn't a virus or famine, but the traitor within. The story begins with torture in a living room. In 1810, 58-year-old novelist Fanny Burney was stricken with breast cancer. Her only chance of survival was to lie on an operating table and surrender to seven men with knives. No anesthesia then. She recalled in a letter to her sister the knife piercing her breast, cutting veins, arteries, muscles, and nerves. She felt the scalpel scraping bones. This 20-minute ordeal felt like a lifetime, but miraculously allowed her to live 29 more years. This is the first creed in mankind's fight against cancer, a law written in blood and screams. Find it and remove it. Yet, when anesthesia silences cries, breast cancer treatment becomes more cruel. William Halstead, the father of modern American surgery, peaked this cruelty introducing surgical gloves to protect his nurse's hands, later his wife, and dared to remove his mother's gallbladder at the table. But the other side of this genius was that he became a drug slave while researching cocaine. Later, during withdrawal treatment, he got addicted to morphine. Perhaps it was drug-induced paranoia that made Halstead believe cancer would spread like a drop of ink on a tablecloth. The only cure was to remove the tablecloth and all surrounding suspicious tissue. In 1894, he proposed radical mastectomy, akin to excavation. The blade went beyond the breast, removing the pectoralis major muscle, lymph nodes, and sometimes ribs. Halstead's method let 40% of patients survive five years. Around then, British surgeon Stephen Paget, after reviewing 735 cases, proposed cancer spreads not like ink, but as seeds and blood to distant organs like liver and bone. Paget was indeed right, but his voice was overshadowed by the halo of Halstead's heroism for nearly a century, during which thousands of women were needlessly mutilated on the operating table for a flawed theory. When the scalpel's limits were exposed, humans turned to two invisible weapons. One was radium, discovered by the Curies, emitting powerful rays that shrank cancerous tissue. Radium was once hailed as a miraculous cure, added to cosmetics, health drinks, and even candy and toothpaste. However, the myth quickly and tragically collapsed. The first victims were the dial painters, young women who were instructed to lick their brushes into fine points, ingesting radium daily, unknowingly. They swallowed radium daily, their bodies glowing mysteriously. People called them radium girls, Years later, their teeth fell out, jaws shattered like decayed wood, bones ached, and they died soon after. Meanwhile, radium consumers paid with their lives. American tycoon buyers drank one, 400 bottles of radium water in two years. In 1930, his jawbone necrotized and tumor spread. The newspaper's black humor, radium water worked until his jaw fell off became radium's obituary. Another weapon's birth began in hell. During World War II, a US ship with a weapon mustard gas was hit by Germans. Military doctors found the gas had a devastating effect on rapidly dividing white blood cells. If it could kill normal cells, it could also kill rapidly dividing cancer cells. After the war, this idea was brought into the lab. Scientists first treated advanced lymphoma with nitrogen mustard, a mustard gas derivative. The tumor shrank swiftly. From this grim weapon, modern chemotherapy was born. Since then, surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy have dominated treatment. They achieved great success in the mid to late 20th century, but they were like carpet bombing, destroying cancer cells while leaving the body scorched. The turning point came after the molecular biology revolution, when scientists delve into cells to decipher the genetic code driving cancer. They found cancers often stem from key gene mutations. In 2001, the first targeted drug imatinib emerged, targeting the gene in chronic myeloid leukemia. Overnight, a once fatal illness became a chronic condition manageable with medication. However, cancer cells, masters of evolution, find new mutations to escape. Ultimately, 
scientists turned their attention to our body's most powerful force, the immune system, long neglected. We thought the immune system was blind to cancer cells disguised as friendly. But in the 21st century, scientists found cancer cells evolved a strategy. They engage with break molecules like PD-1 on T cells, handing a friendly pass, paralyzing the army. This discovery led to immunotherapy, which works not by attacking cancer cells, but by removing the barrier between cancer and immune cells. It releases the breaks on the immune system, allowing it to recognize and eliminate traitors. Cardi therapy takes this concept to the extreme. Scientists extract T cells from a patient, engineer them with a navigation head to recognize cancer cells, and infuse these modified soldiers back into the body. These T cells become a living drug, patrolling their homeland and relentlessly hunting. Yet, this is a battle with our own destiny. It's far from over and may never truly end because cancer isn't a foreign invader, it is us. It's an ordinary cell in our body. After billions of replications, it unexpectedly broke free from constraints and embraced life's primitive impulse, infinite proliferation. It exploits life's own systems, blood vessels, growth factors, metabolism to betray survival. A paradox of longer lives. Cells chase immortality, yet self-destruct. When they seek infinity, the body falters. With longevity, traitors multiply as cancer risk rises. We may never invent a perfect weapon to eliminate betrayal, but we are learning to shift from eradication to control, from war to peacekeeping. We will redefine health's limit in the gray area of controlled coexistence. Cancer may still exist that day, but it won't control our destiny.